home of the Trojans and located in beautiful central Oahu. This year, 2023, marks our school's 50th anniversary. To commemorate this monumental year, we are holding numerous events to recognize the extensive and decorated history of our school. One such event will be 50 interviews from 50 different people who have shaped the school into what it is today. These interviews are encapsulated through 50 different videos that will be released weekly between January 2023 to January of 2024. Please join us in this momentous occasion with the people that have witnessed our home's history firsthand. We here at Mililani hope you enjoy learning about our school as much as we cherish retelling it. This is Mililani High School's 50th Anniversary. Today's interview is with Andrew Park, a 2001 graduate who used what he learned at Mililani to help struggling youth navigate through the court system. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Park. I am a Mililani High School class of 2001 graduate, uh, and right now I am a judge at the family court out in Kapolei. You know, just uh, from when I pulled into the parking lot, um, it was a lot of memories. I remember driving in that circle all around the upper parking lot. Um, I remember how bad traffic can get right after school, and you know, all the visitor stalls were, were filled up, and so I managed to park in the same stall that I think I used to park at once I finally got my upper campus parking pass, and I was able to park here uh, instead of down by the uh, tennis courts, um, right by C building. It used to be Miss, um, Mrs. Higa's physics classroom. And we would, would bother her with our loud stereos after class, <laughs> loud exhaust. My time here, um, number one thing, uh, Extracurricular wise, I would say would be the marching band with uh, Mr. Murphy, Murph, uh, who's now I guess the principal yeah. over here. Uh, it's awesome to see. So marching band uh, and um, physics club um, with the aforementioned Mrs. Higa, who um, it was a good place to look out the window to make sure our cars were still there <laughs> and have a place to hang out uh, after school. Right, make a quick getaway to make the a party. Quick, make a quick getaway. <laughs> yeah, my core friend group is still. Uh, by and large, the same friends I had from, from here that I made here um, that were roommates with me on the band trips, mm -hmm. you know, to the Tournament of Roses Parade in our, or to Japan. And just, you know, going to school a while ago, like how you and I did, you know, it was kind of right the beginning of, um, you know, computers and like, cell phones and yeah. social media so you know i would still you know we would still try to come up with like witty away messages for our aol instant messenger that brings back to but, but <laughs> we would still come together and talk about stuff you know like yeah. recess hanging out by sea building lockers or i don't know if it's still there or just meeting in the parking lot everybody try and get to school early so you can we can park all in a row right. <laughs> you know yeah, it was really, it was a really good, good time. Uh, so you were in the marching band for four years. I was in the marching band for three years. Sorry, okay. Mr. Murphy. <laughs> After that last um, junior year, that big trip, um, that, that, that was a wrap. That was a, <laughs> that was a wrap. Um, I was not a good musician at all. Um, I played the clarinet. It was light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was light and it was resin, and I couldn't damage it too much. <laughs> But it was, it was terrific. Um, my section leader, um, I actually saw in his professional capacity. You know, he's he's a police officer now. We would work together sometimes um, back when I was at the prosecutor's office, uh, and you know, he's still a terrific person, someone I still look up to. You know, and gee, I remember Mr. Murphy um, yelling at a, not yelling, encouraging us. Uh, during our conditioning um, exercises uh, to get ready for the Rose, Rose Bowl Parade uh, as we somehow had like a running route around all around Mililani yeah. that I definitely didn't cheat or shortcut in any way. Yeah. So when I was in high school, um, number one thing to me I think is um, I would be soccer. Mm. You know, I, 
right around uh, when I was a senior, um, it was like the back-to-back -back kind of state champion uh, soccer time. And more from uh, my perspective is, you know, Mr. Murphy ran a terrific marching band program. Mm -hmm. We were always like you know, class double A or triple A or whatever it was at all the band competitions. And you know, we put in a lot of effort um, on the practice field and, sure. you know, nighttime and stuff like that. And also, I guess, kind of more on the other side is like kind of spoiled kids with like loud Hondas and stuff, yeah. of which I was one. Still yet, still yet. <laughs> still yet. <laughs> I remember some some teachers that really stuck out to me. Um, Mr. or Dr. John Topolinsky from our social studies class to um, Mrs. Fujimoto for advanced English, placement yeah. English. Um, Mrs. Higa who, for physics and our, our physics club advisor. <laughs> I remember we'd post our grades. We would have to come up with an alias that was like secret only to us. Yeah. And so she would post our grades on like a bulletin board, but then none of us could remember our alias. Mm -hmm. And some of our aliases that we chose were not like suitable for posting, and so she would have to change them. And then we'd have to bother her and ask us and ask her what our grade was anyway. Even subjects that I wasn't initially interested in, you know, they really made it enjoyable approachable and even if I didn't get the best grades um, I did I did have a good time and I felt like mm. you, know. you, you sit on the bench as a family court judge um, did you always foresee that in your future I always knew that I wanted to go into law um, my thought was that I was gonna be a prosecutor and just stay a prosecutor um, mm. for my entire career um, but you know and that's where I started out and you know, I had some opportunities. I, I got to go on my own and start you know a small um, small practice in criminal defense with some some of my colleagues from the prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, opportunity came up to try and become a judge. And I didn't think that I would you know maybe get it, but I tried a few times and I was lucky enough to get uh, selected. And one of the things that I'm really proud about is when I get to tell people that I'm from public school, first of all, and specifically that I'm from Milan. Mm. As you, you know, in the legal profession, a lot of our, you know, colleagues, opposing counsel, the other attorneys, you know, they might come from private school from you know, different, you know, for different reasons, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm always really proud to say that, hey, from public school and when I have kids you know that I get to talk to or when I get to visit schools I'm like hey I came from I came from this school or mm -hmm. I came from public school and I'm the same place everybody else is at yeah you feel like that you know that background just kind of I mean being in family court people in your courtroom can kind of find some familiarity with you in that regard I think I think it can help in, in a lot of situations uh, and I think that just to be able to you know, sit down and be real with people and say, hey, you know, I know maybe what this is or I have some experience with something you might be going through right mm -hmm. now. And, um, maybe if it didn't happen to me, maybe I had friends or I had neighbors um, who kind of went to the same kind of a situation. And so I, I've seen up close how it can affect people. And so I don't think that I'm distant, you know, just because I'm sitting in a particular chair or whatever. Let me help because yeah. this is one you know, one community we're all you know in this together, and let's let's try and help out you as a family or your child as a as a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it can be intimidating in the in the courtroom, right? Just you're, you're sitting up there, and then um, a few times I've had to do jury duty. Uh, yeah, I found that it, it can be intimidating when you have to address the judge. After Melani High School, I did one year of school in Oregon. Okay. At Pacific University because okay. Coach Jeff Grandin came and was you know, talking to people here in this very library um, and they had a lot of scholarship money available but then I came back three years um, to finish up at UH Manoa and then law school also at UH Manoa and then right after that you went into the prosecutor's office right after that I went to the prosecutor's office so a lot of uh, getting up when it was still dark driving from Mililani to UH 
sleep in the parking structure a little bit. Yeah. And then go class. Right. Come back. Were you also working at the time too? Or? I, I just, whatever easy jobs on campus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I still am uh, on the board of directors for Mental Health of America of Hawaii. And it was something that really um, became of interest to me in my time after I left the prosecutor's office when I was working in private criminal defense. A lot of my clients um, I was appointed to represent, you know, because they were you know, indigent, they couldn't afford counsel, and they had some sort of a conflict with the public defender's office. And apart from uh, substance use issues, an overwhelming amount of my clients had struggles with their mental health. Um, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning and you know, says to themselves, I'm gonna get arrested today, I'm gonna commit a crime, or I'm gonna you know, victimize somebody. More often than not, it is coming from you know, some other root issue. And you know, mental health um, isn't, or at that time, wasn't something that was really people like to talk about. Yeah. But it affects all of us all the time. And I think if there's one maybe positive thing that came out of the whole COVID-19 pandemic is that people, I feel like, started to take mental health, you know, maybe more seriously. Maybe it came to the forefront a little bit. Um, and so, you know, one of the ways that I try and, you know, give back to my community is, you know, by serving on that board mm. and kind of giving my insights or doing whatever it is I can do to help open up that conversation yeah. so that people can be more aware of it, people can feel more comfortable talking about it mm -hmm. um, just day to day. Uh, it's obviously uh, very admirable um, on your part. Um, I think mental health is something that we hear our students talking about now a lot, um, as you mentioned, especially in the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, in your capacity as a family court judge, um, what kind of issues are you seeing as far as uh, mental health with our youth that come into your court? You know, a lot of the young people that uh, I see in court, you know, some of them haven't been in school. Some of them missed all of intermediate school. Uh, and so, you know, they were, a, they were a fifth grader and then they blink and now they're, now they're supposed to be in high school. You know, if they don't have or family support uh, for a lot of these young people. School was the constant. And school was the main primary support. Their teachers or you know, just being on campus, having mm -hmm. something to eat. Uh, and you know, those are the those are the people that I feel the worst for because they, they lost out on a very important, and very formative chunk. Uh, and, and of course, they're going to have issues because. I would have issues too, probably, sure. um, if a fourth of my education was taken away from me and all of a sudden I had to be a high school. Yeah. So you know, whatever it is that we can do, you know, we try and offer any services, you know, do whatever it is we can help and be understanding and empathetic um, to these children and these families as well. When working with children, um, our number one goal is always to try and help that child. The best way that we can help that child is usually offering that child services or treatment, rehabilitation. Uh, sometimes, unfortunately, as you probably know, the only way we can help that child is to kind of move that child from the situation for a little bit you know, and keep them in one spot, you know, even if it's against their will, be yeah. that uh, detention or be that uh, youth prison. Uh, the good thing is that at least, you know, I've had a number of young people who uh, have gone to the youth correctional facility and they've been able to get their diploma, they've been able to get certifications, and they've come out as productive, you know, productive adults. So it's the, to me the last resort, but sometimes that's necessary and yeah. sometimes that really is the best thing for that young person. One of the uh, greatest compliments that I ever got professionally was a uh, counselor, social worker from the youth correctional facility who tracked me down after graduation uh, one night and 
told me that, hey, I have a lot of the um, youth that you know that you sent to youth prison, and they all say that they really respected you or they appreciated that you listened to them and that yeah. uh, you treated them fairly, even if you had to do something that was you know drastic enough as sending them to youth prison. And that um, that was one of the best things that I could have heard because mm-hmm. it's not an easy choice, and it's a choice that I don't think any of us ever want to make. Sure. But just to know that it's working out somehow and that they understand mm-hmm. um, was very was very gratifying to hear. If you would like to attend our 50th anniversary gala, or if you want more information about our 50th anniversary, please visit the websites linked in the description below. To keep up with our weekly interviews, please subscribe and or check out our 50th anniversary playlist.